Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 8, and I'll be reading verses 1 to 11. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, Yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. As we come immediately before Christmas, I want to take you again to a little bit of an unusual Christmas passage. Throughout the New Testament, we find Bethlehem, though not named, we find the incarnation, that wonder that God the Father sent his Son, sent him from heaven as an apostle to this world, an apostle being one who comes to us with a message, a message of vital importance. It's scattered throughout, not just the gospel accounts, but the letters of Paul and to the end of the New Testament. You need sometimes to have your hearing very finely tuned to what is taking place. And so it is here in Romans chapter 8, and Paul, as he speaks of how that God, the Father, sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. But let's back up a little bit and take a running start at what is taking place here in Romans chapter 8. Here we are, smack in the middle of Paul's great theological treatise. Romans reads very differently than any of Paul's other letters. Paul is addressing a church that he himself had not initiated, that he had not begun. And furthermore, it was a church that he, in fact, had never visited himself, though he was anticipating eagerly to be among them and to share the word of God with them. And to have them encourage him on his way as he headed west, as he says, his eager desire was to preach the gospel in Spain, ever looking for those new fields where Christ had never yet been proclaimed, that he would have the joy of introducing men and women to this wonderful Savior who had saved him and had transformed him, mightily transformed him. Paul, he has been leading us 
through, if you read Romans once again, he has been leading us through how that the gospel has come to men and women who were utterly lost and undone. We were as guilty as guilty could possibly be. And what we could never do in and of ourselves, God was the one who stepped forward. When we were dead in our trespasses and sins, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, God was the one who stepped forward and took the initiative because of the love which he has, has not just had, but has for us, present tense. But Paul, he would outline how that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is life everlasting. He would tell us that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you put those two together and you realize that every one of us are under the sentence of death. If all have sinned and come short of the plan of of the righteousness of God, and if every one of us are sinners, then every one of us are under the condemnation of death. Every one of us are in fact on death row. Paul would continue to move forward and he would talk in Romans chapter 5 that we are now justified. We are justified by the work of God as he writes, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Past tense, we have been justified by faith. Jesus Christ took the sin penalty for you and for me upon Calvary's cross, and he said, it is finished, finished. We have been justified. The gavel has come down on the judge's desk And we have been declared not guilty, not because we actually were not guilty, but because someone else, Jesus Christ, has taken the penalty for us. Our sin has been imputed to him, and there has been an imputation of his life into us so that we, dead and buried in our sins, We have been made alive with Christ. So we have been justified. And now we come to chapter 8, and Paul says, Therefore, based upon all that he has led us up to and all the rich teaching that he gives to us that we rightly spend weeks and weeks and weeks mulling over and chewing on and feasting on, he comes to this point at the very midpoint of the book of Romans, And he says, therefore, based upon all of this, there is this glad news that there is now no condemnation, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I meet up with a lot of people who are yet under condemnation, and they need not be. I hear from them by, the, by phone, I hear from them by email, I hear from them by snail mail, I hear from them in person, and they are weighed down with what ought not to weigh them down. The Apostle Paul declared it plain and simply, therefore, because of what Christ has done, not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has done and our confidence in His workmanship, he, the greatest workman that ever was, because of our confidence that there is nothing to be added to his workmanship. Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, they are regarded as master workmen. They are regarded as geniuses, but they don't hold a candle to Jesus Christ as the great master worker, as the the great genius. 
Well, Jesus, he finished the work. There was nothing to add to it. And as a result, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, those who are dwelling in him, those who have confidence in him. How often I have said to people, don't live under a cloud. There's that Charlie Brown character who forever goes around with a cloud hanging over. Don't live under a cloud. We must not allow the devil to rob us of the joy which Jesus wants us to live in. No condemnation. And Paul, he explains it, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Once again, the scriptures are at pains to push us that it is through Christ, it is in Christ, it is because of Christ that we have what we have, that we are free from the burden of guilt and that we are free from the shame of sin. In Christ, this law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and of death. But the devil, liar that he is, deceiver, trickster, extraordinaire, he continues to plague Christians and to try to infuse believers with this belief that we are still under condemnation, that there is still a balance outstanding, and that we cannot enter into the joy that we desperately would like to. But we have been set free. We have been set free from the law of sin and of death, which previously worked so powerfully among us. For what the law could not do over centuries and even millennia, weak as it was through the flesh, our study in the book of Hebrews helped us understand that very well, Weak was the law through the flesh. It was my problem, not that the law was weak. It was because of my flesh was weak. Well, what the law could not do, God did. And this is what he did. This is how he acted. He sent his own son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Paul, he echoes that here, that God did what an amazing thing it was. He sent not an angel, not a seraphim, not an archangel. It wasn't Michael or Gabriel. It was Jesus Christ the very Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity that was sent as the answer. Now that underscores just how serious sin is. Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the Garden of Eden, they immediately sensed that everything was out of place. First of all, there was the realization that they were naked, and then God comes to them and speaks to them as they are huddled behind some bushes or trees and they have taken some leaves and they're trying to cover themselves in various places. And they immediately also realize that the woman is against the man and the man is against the woman and all of a sudden they are against nature and they're pointing fingers. They had never done that before. But all of a sudden, there is a fracture. There is a break that has taken place because of sin. And God expresses it himself and says, What have you done? Perhaps it would be helpful for us, at least, to say, Do you know what you have done? God understood what the price would be 
Adam and Eve, they likely understood that things were very strange and this, this freedom that they had thought they were entering into because of the serpent's conniving and cunning, that it hadn't worked out the way they hoped it would. Yes, their eyes had been opened, but they were not like God. And if this was what God was like, they didn't want to be in that condition. All of a sudden, things were strange. But God, he understood the price. And he understood that an angel coming into this world, there was all kinds of accounts of angels coming into this world. You can find those passages in the Old Testament. That didn't work. But here, God sending his own son, not somebody else's son, he sent his own son. God steps up to the plate, and though the price was immense, immense, God steps up and he says, I will pay it. I will send my very own son, and he will come not in radiant glory and splendor. We read of the splendor of God in the Old Testament when God came down upon Mount Sinai to meet with Moses and there was thundering and lightning and there was trumpet blast and all of the drama. Or we could think of when Solomon was dedicating that shiny new temple in Jerusalem that he had built. And it says that when he had finished his prayer, that the place was filled with smoke, that the priests could not conduct the service which they had prepared to offer drama. But here, Jesus, he comes in the likeness of sinful flesh. On three occasions, I have gone with my wife to a hospital and I have seen sinful flesh come into this world. That is, I have seen my three daughters being born and knowing that they were as fallen as I. I have seen sinful flesh come into this world and I tell you, without going into detail, it's a bit of a messy business. Childbirth is an extraordinarily messy business. Well, this is in fact what took place at Bethlehem. Jesus Christ, he does not come in shiny, radiant, sanitary splendor. He comes in the same way as you and I entered into this world. It was a messy business. And it wasn't simply a messy business on the floor or in that stable out behind the Bethlehem Inn. But it was messy all the way through the way. Mary, I'm sure there were many who misunderstood what was taking place. Joseph himself thought that Mary had cheated on him and was considering quietly putting her away, not wanting to disgrace her because of his love for her, but wanting to break off their arrangement. But God, he was working. And these two, they were ready to submit themselves to the plan of God. God was at work. God took the initiative. God acted when we didn't know what to do. We didn't know what to do about our sin. The priests of the Old Testament, they were doing what they could, but that was all looking forward to a time when a perfect sacrifice could be offered. And here he comes. God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and, it says, as an offering for sin. It's an amazing thing. In the Old Testament, the worshipers of Moloch, Whenever you find the god Moloch mentioned in the Old Testament, you have an indication 
of how desperately low the Jews had fallen in their worship. They would inevitably go off to serve Baal and the Asherah pole and other things, but whenever you read that they have come to worship Moloch, he was the God who would demand child sacrifice, and it was a hideous thing. Here is a likeness, a likeness. The price of sin, your sin and mine, that the Holy Lamb of God, the Holy Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, came into this world in order to be the sacrifice for you and for me, but not sacrificed as a child, but coming as a baby and as a child to be born there, to grow, to minister, to speak words of wisdom, to challenge people to come to him, to speak parables, to work miracles, to let his disciples have a first-hand glimpse of who he was and for him to open their eyes to the glories of heaven and what God's plan truly was. For some of them to have an even closer and more intimate experience as they did on the Mount of Transfiguration or when he went in and raised Jairus' daughter up from death. But Jesus then comes, and in the final days of his life, having tried many times to tell his disciples of what was ahead, but their heads were so filled with other things and so thick with the thoughts of glory, Jesus now comes as an offering for sin and what does he do in this offering for sin? He condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus Christ had come in the likeness of flesh, sinful flesh, and by doing, by being that offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You remember how that in Genesis, man was made in the likeness of God. That was the crowning privilege of man. That not the giraffe or the elephant or the lion or the cheetah or the monkey or the slime, the, the, the slug, they were not made in the likeness of God. But on the sixth day and the final act of creation, God, he makes a man and out of the man he makes a woman and Man was made in the likeness, in the image of God. Now, several thousand years pass, and we have a turnaround. A need has arisen, and there is only one remedy, there is only one answer for the urgent need of our sinful condition. And that is that the Son of God that part of the divine Godhead would come and be made in the likeness of us, but not made in our likeness as we were in the opening days of the Garden of Eden, rather that he would be made in the likeness, not perfectly like us because he was sinless, but that he would be made in the likeness of sinful man, born of a virgin, having the need to learn, to eat and to drink, to talk, that he would take upon himself this kind of a body and that he would grow and to be our substitute. Paul continues on through 
chapter 8, and I come to verse 11, he says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Here we have a strong emphasis upon the work of Jesus Christ and the work of the Spirit who takes the things that Christ has done and makes them real to us and impacts us so powerfully as we could never have been impacted. Jesus Christ came into this world, born of a virgin. It all had a driving point. It all heads forward. And the point is that you and I might now know no condemnation. That is why Jesus Christ came into this world. It wasn't simply to call the shepherds from the fields, and it wasn't simply to call the magi from their books and from all of their learning to go on this enormous trek, first of all to Jerusalem and then a few miles away to Bethlehem to bring their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It was not simply that there be parables to intrigue and to entertain the people on the hills of Galilee, nor that a few people on a couple of days would be fed with just this tiny little bit of food that Jesus would miraculously multiply. The whole reason why Jesus came from the glories of heaven in order to be born in Bethlehem was that you, my friend, that you and I might now be free of the weight of sin and condemnation and that we could look the devil in the eye and say, devil, you are a liar. Jesus has declared it is finished and that there is now by faith no condemnation. For Jesus, the master workman, the master workman, the maestro of the universe's music that he has finished and I trust in him. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your work among us in, at Bethlehem and how that that was completely in the plan of God to bring about a Redeemer, a Savior, who would save us from our sins. Your very name, Jesus, means Savior. And from the very beginning of your life to the end of your earthly pilgrimage, how we rejoice in you. May there be men and women here now who would receive you unto themselves and say that, Lord, even though I've so many other times pushed you away, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, I pray. Save me and make me ready for heaven, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen.